Welcome, everyone, uh, to the White House Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are so glad that you are here with us, either live or watching us online. Um, this is our live stream Bible study hour, and um, we are so glad that you have joined us today. We are hoping that you receive a blessing from studying with us this hour. Um, this week, we are studying in the quarterly, my, uh, no, God's mission, my mission. And this week's topic is Mission to the Powerful. And what a powerful study that we are about to jump into. Um, so we do have a free offer. Uh, this free offers uh, this week, it is called, Is It a Sin to be Tempted? Is it a sin to be tempted? Um, if you would like to know what the Bible has to say about that, please click on the QR code that's on the screen, or you can join us live at whitehousesda.com forward slash library and click on that free offer there and we will ship that out to you real quickly. Also, while you're online, we do have a prayer and pray section. If you would like to um, let us know what you're praying for, what your requests are, or maybe you have a praise that you're just so thankful that God has answered for you this week. We have prayer warriors here at White House, so we would love to join you in those requests. Um, so while you're on our website, click on that as well and fill that out. All right, Don. Absolutely. I know each of us has needs that we need to reach out to God and pray. Amen. I thank you very much for that recommendation and that offer because it's very important. Let's look at our memory text and get into our lesson. We'll jump right in. Our memory text today, and this was a troubling one as you really read it and contemplate on what this memory text is about. It's found in Matthew 16, 26. For what profit is it to a man... If he gains the whole world and loses his soul, or what will a man give in exchange for mm -hmm. his soul? Ouch. Yep. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> Let's pray before we start and dive in. Father, we thank you so very much for your Bible. We thank you for the promise that no matter who we are, no matter what we are, no matter where we are, that you still love us and that you want us to be your child and you want us in the kingdom of heaven, no matter what, no matter where, no matter how. Please help us to always keep that first and foremost as we reach out to those around us that no one is considered a lost soul to God unless they choose not to be part of your kingdom. Mm -hmm. Help us to love everybody as you love us, if it will be thy will. Amen. Amen. That was one of the touching sentences in the beginning of this lesson on the introduction was whether in the 7th century Judea or the 21st century Brazil mm -hmm. or the United States, Israel, Africa, anywhere you are, people are basically the same. And you know what we mean by that? We're all sinners. We are all sinners in need of divine grace. Anybody here not need a Savior? Anybody want to hold up their hand? I'll call you out real quick, Chris, if you do. No, you're shaking your head no real quick. You need the Savior as well. And that's the most important thing. I don't care whether you're rich or poor or in between, mm -hmm. homeless or have the finest mansion on the palace mm -hmm. of this earth, you need Jesus Christ in your life as your Savior. That's right. You got anything you want to add to that before we jump into Sunday's lesson? No, God is just concerned about our salvation um, of the rich and the powerful, right? Yeah. I mean as well as the needy. So um, we're going to learn about some lessons. Um, you know, there's a lot of them. The Bible talks about the rich and the powerful, Abraham, Isaac, Job, Joseph, just to name a few, Solomon. Um, but this week we're going to look at the three ends, which is Nebuchadnezzar, Naaman, and Nicodemus, right. the three ends. I, I didn't so, think of it as the three ends, but yeah, that's a good way I, to call I it. I noticed that. So well, let's, okay, that's nice. let's jump right in on Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. And one of the big things on him, I love the story. It's in Daniel chapter 4. He had two experiences with, he, with Daniel. Mm -hmm. And it was troubling to me at the beginning of this is immediately when he had this second dream mm -hmm. that none of, that he couldn't understand. And, of course, he called out to the devil people first, you know, to help him Mm -hmm. his, his soothsayers or his magicians or astrologers or whoever, right. please tell me what this dream means. And immediately they couldn't do it, so they contacted Daniel. And so Daniel came in, and lo and behold, he got the message from Daniel. Mm -hmm. But the poor man didn't jump on the bandwagon. He had a really good experience the first time around where he had the golden image. 
But this second time around, he had this wild dream about suddenly this big tree. It got cut down, but there was a band put around the base of it. And, and seven times passed over, and out right. there in the field, and all the dew of the heaven falling down on him and mm -hmm. stuff, and he couldn't figure out what in the world the dream meant. What mm -hmm. did, did, it just troubled him. Mm -hmm. You know, they put way more emphasis on dreams back then, I guess, than we do today. Because I have some crazy dreams, but I don't take them. I can't even remember what they are after a day yeah, or two. I know. <laughs> but, you know, I, I've gone with them, and, and I, sometimes I remember them enough to tell my wife, and we'll laugh about how crazy the dream was. Mm -hmm. But, it, you know, we just don't place emphasis on those, I guess. But anyway, this dream had a serious meaning mm -hmm. for King Nebuchadnezzar. And it was to basically tell him that I, God, see your spirit, and I see something in you right, right. that the rest of the world cannot see. And this is the big thing is, you know, we have to be careful on judging other people or judging mm -hmm. people because which one of us would have thought that Nicodemus was salvageable for the kingdom mm -hmm. of God? Or Nebuchadnezzar. Or Nebuchadnezzar. Right. right. Nebuchadnezzar. Well, and I believe this story kind of has a lot of players in it because it kind of goes back, and I think about reading Jeremiah. Um, you know, the prophet uh, had, you know, prophesied that uh, that it would be, that Jerusalem would be besieged. Right. Well, who, he was in prison. Who freed him? It was Nebuchadnezzar. Right. The Babylonians freed Jeremiah. And I think, you know, that Nebuchadnezzar actually got this sense of the holy God, you know, you know, from the prophecies that Jeremiah had told um, that would happen to his, you know, his yeah. country or his, um, yeah. So the ba Babylonians had undoubtedly, they had favor in Jeremiah because they knew that, the, you know, these prophecies were the, the prophecies for uh, Babylon, yeah, King Nebuchadnezzar. So I think, you know, Nebuchadnezzar's heart was really true to the God, you know, just didn't understand a lot of things. So there, I think that, you know, God sees, of course, he sees our heart, um, and he continues to have players throughout our life to, uh, to eventually make that transformation. So we're about to see that transformation so anyway, here. The beauty of it was is <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar was cut down, lost his mind for seven yep. years, lived in the field, ate grass, dirt, yep. whatever, Hair and nails grew, looked horrible. I can only imagine what the man looked like at the end of seven years. But finally A he beast, did. probably. <laughs> <laughs> finally he, you know, I've had homeless people that I've had to take care of that have come out of the dumpster, and I know what they look like. And I, but mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar had been around in the dumpster a little bit longer than these guys had, so he had to be yep. really rough. Yeah. And, but he came to himself finally. Yeah. And here's what I really like about it. It's in yeah. verse 37. I'm going to focus in on that. All right. Daniel chapter 4, verse 37. At the end, after all of this experience, God finally got through to him, and he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, extol, and honor the king of heaven, mm -hmm. all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. Right. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put to down. Mm -hmm. And what an amazing example of how he used Daniel. Right, right? Um, you know, to we should be inst inspired by Daniel too from this story. Um, he was consistent, consistent with his faith. Um, so whether it is for the lowly or for the need and the rich and the powerful, we should be consistent with our faith no matter what. Um, so we're so often we do community service for the homeless, or we're in prisons, we're in hospitals, we're you know we're we feel comfortable in those situations where we may be accepted in, the, in, in that position in the needy. But here Daniel is, of course, he's up there and he's friends with or knows acquaintances with the king, um, but he was consistent in his faith. Um, so, so, so shall we. We might not know anybody powerful, but maybe we know somebody that knows somebody. So it's important that we stay consistent in our faith and hold firm to what is true. And God's not a respecter of persons. Right. You know, and that's the funny thing. You know, whether we like it or not, a man that's a millionaire or a multimillionaire, you recognize them as having a bit more than me and you. That's right. But look at God who owns the entire universe. Mm -hmm. What is that man next to what God is or right. has? Yeah. That's can, a drop, he, in the, drop in the bucket or a grain of sand. That's right. 
It, and everyone qualifies for God's redemption. Right. We, we you know, kind of talk about that a little bit, the unlimited atonement. Right. And what does that mean to us here at the church? That means that we believe Christ's death was for everyone, Absolutely. not just us or some of us that, you know, it's for everyone, no matter if you're rich, powerful, poor, lowly, or whoever you are, it's everyone. That's so. the reason you'll hear me say in the Sabbath school lesson on a regular basis, and I like to hammer this point home to everybody. You need to hear this. Mm -hmm. God is love. Yeah. God is love. He loves you. He loves me. And he wants each and every one of us in his kingdom for eternity. That's right. He's not trying to single out anybody. He has no anger or vindictiveness about him. He wants you in the kingdom of heaven with him for eternity. That's right. And let me read 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. If you want to go right, there go with right me. Ahead. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, it says, Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? Um, so that's just an example. We should prayerfully uh, look for area of opportunity to where we can meet the hungry souls of our leaders and our peers uh, instead of criticizing the church leaders or whoever is in authority over us, right, um, or the powers over the nations, right, we should be praying for them, helping them in any way um, that God leads us to pray to, to help them. And we, like like I said, we might not come into contact or be friends with, uh, you know, the president of the United States, but we are in contact with the leader of this church. We should be, you know, praying for him and his family, um, asking if, if there's anything that we can do to help, you know, him and, and his, you know, going forward. So there's, you know, there's, and, and let the Holy Spirit lead us. So we should daily pray, be praying for the Holy Spirit to lead us on who we can help today or pray for today. Absolutely. Jesus loves everyone. Let's flip on over to Monday's okay. lesson. And dear sweet Naaman. And here's this little girl that was taken captive mm -hmm. and wound up being in the household of Naaman to take care of the wife of Naaman, who was a most powerful soldier who was over the king's guard, basically, mm -hmm. supervising them, taking care of them, making sure they had and, and took care of the king. And lo and behold, suddenly he comes down with that dreaded disease called leprosy. Mm -hmm. And leprosy in those days was basically a death sentence. Yep. If you got leprosy, you got sent out, of the, sent out of the community, you had to go live in the leper colony, basically, yeah. and you existed until the leprosy ate your skin and your flesh until you died. Mm -hmm. It was a horrible, painful, slow, methodic disease that won every time. Yeah. And I can only imagine Naaman's wife, how upset she was, and this little poor girl mm -hmm. that was her maid listening to Miss Naaman's I guess we could call her Miss Naaman because we don't get her name <laughs> in the Bible. We don't get her name, no. We don't get her name in the Bible. But anyway, the lady of the house, mm -hmm. and she meekly goes up to her and says, you know, there's a prophet in the land that I came from that has connections with God, mm -hmm. and he can heal Mr. Naaman. Amen. Yeah, and so, you know, the, the study doesn't really talk about the girl, but I'm glad that you brought her out because she is such an important piece to this, it this, is. this story. Um, but let's look at, in verse 17 and ni through 19, let's just look at what Naaman had, um, you know, had said once he was cured, you know, and we'll kind of go back and, and I will as far as, you know, leading us up to where he, he, he makes two requests after he is healed from his leprosy. I find those entertaining. Yeah, they show, I know. It's they show like, even though he was healed, uh, but he still didn't it's so fully powerful, understand. The way God just miraculously moves, you know. And so, anyway, let's look verses 17 through 19. Do you want to read that or you want me to? I'll do it. I don't mind. Okay. 5, 17 through 19. All right. So Naaman said, Then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth. For your servant will no longer offer either burnt offerings or sacrifices to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the temple of Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Rimmon. When I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. 
Then Elijah said to him, go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. I love that. Okay, so first, Naaman asked for two mule loads of dirt because he thinks that the God is in the dirt, I guess. He brings the dirt back to no, Syria. No, he thinks that... He or, thinks that only God is, is in, in Israel. Right. Uh-huh. Where the, the promised people are and where Elijah was. Exactly. And, and that the God was not able to come into the area of Syria where he lived. Right. Which he didn't understand. Right. Exactly. So the, he thinks that, you know, okay, if I bring some of this earth from Israel, I will have a piece of this. And so the second thing he requests is that, you know, he's no longer going to serve the Syria God, Reman, Right. Um, but he had no intentions of forsaking his, his duties in the earthly king at, to the earthly king. Well, that was his job. But that was his job. So he wasn't planning on, you know, leaving the job. But he did say, no longer do I wish to bow down to Rimmon. Um, so, I, like you said, you know, we'll come back to this in just a minute. But I would like to make mention of the maid. Um, she was a brave, enough to, brave enough to make the suggestion, right, that I have someone who can cure your, your disease, Naaman, Right. Uh, who lives forever, and um, and and so we see this girl that was true to her values, and that made a little suggestion that changed the course of history for Naaman and for so many others. So we see that she's a seed sower. So shall we be, right? right. Led by the Holy Spirit, a little maid who learned how to forgive and how to love her enemies despite her situation. Yeah, could you imagine? If I were taken, ripped out away from my family and taken to a foreign land and became the servant mm-hmm. of somebody, That's right. I would not be very happy. Not happy at all. But this little girl made the best of a bad situation. That's right. And became respected in the household. That's right. Because the woman actually listened to her. Yep. Yes. And that's so a, that's a big thing right there. That tells that says a lot. Exactly. Yeah. Obedience or listening to and, and, and have, you know, reverence, you know, to to okay, what what do you what do you have that can heal my husband, right? And also it goes to the fact of her mom, mm-hmm. her parents and having raised her and what they had taught her oh, in yeah. her few years that they had with her. That's right. About the, the true God of heaven. Mm-hmm. This girl had this girl had been trained. Yep. And she, you know, obviously was um, showing, you know, practice on the verse Matthew 5, 44 through 45. And it tells us, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. So again, back to her being persecuted in a sense that she's a captive, but she learned to forgive. Um, so and then uh, kind of going through the story, right? Um, Naaman refused to listen to the prophet, Elijah. At first. At first. You didn't right? like him. Elijah yeah. says, go dip in the... I've not uh, been to... Mike over here has been to the River Jordan. Yep. If I'm not mistaken, wasn't it pretty a muddy-looking, yucky river, filthy-looking river, river? And that's what Naaman, when he goes up to it, he says, this river, I've got to bathe in this nasty water? Exactly. He's like, oh. Uh, the rivers Do you know in Syria <laughs> are clear. I know. I go down to the creek close to my mom's house when I was young, and we look at the water, and it's nice and clear. You can see the bottom. You can see the fish swimming around. Everything's nice and clear. You know, I would. I and you know, I enjoyed swimming and splashing around in that water. Mm-hmm. Go over to Cross Plains at Red River. Yeah. Where we used to, as we were kids, we would go swimming in different swimming holes. It was it was clay looking water. It was red. You couldn't see the bottom. You couldn't even see a fish in there or anything. Mm. And that's where my friends wanted to go swimming. I didn't want to get in that water because you couldn't see anything in the water. Right. So I can imagine Naaman, look at this nasty water. Why am I asked to get in here? Yeah, that's right. An element of faith, his servant, though, that was with him said, Now listen, Naaman, I love you, I serve you, and I respect you, and I'm going to do my thing with you, but listen to me just a little bit. Now if that prophet had told you to go stand on your head in front of the king of Jerusalem and do some kind of calisthenic whatever... Would you have done it? Absolutely. He would have been proud to because that was something that was worthy of his stature and his status. That's right. All this man's asked you to do is go dip in the River Jordan seven times. Right. And let's read that in 13 and 14. Sure, I'll read go ahead. It. And it says, and this is Naaman's uh, servants, and his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would, not, would you have not have done it? How much more then when, we, when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And so he did this, um, 
because the servants, you know, loved him so much. They loved Naaman. They wanted to see him cure. They right. wanted him healed. So we see another player in how this, you know, it, it's played out to someone's redemption or, you know, conversion or to someone's understanding of the true God. God it's not just to, one person. It's several people along the way. Right. God, through Elijah, had to humble Naaman mm -hmm. to recognize it wasn't his power or anything special about him. That's right. It was the God of heaven that heals. That's right. It's the God of heaven that heals. It's the God of heaven that loves you. Mm -hmm. It's the God of heaven that wants to save you. That's right. Not by any power or anything that you do of yourself or any of your personal merit or your personal worth. It's the God of heaven you have to bow down to and That's to right. acknowledge as your Savior. Mm -hmm. And get this. So we go back to what the two requests were, right? right. He wanted some dirt, and he wasn't going to bow down anymore. And so Elijah, remember the response? Elijah, go in peace. Yeah, that was Elijah's peace. response. It's not that Elijah started to condone him and say, well, that's not how you serve God. Let me, let me start breaking down doctrines to you, okay? This is how one, two, three, we're going to serve God. You know, Elijah said, you know. He was a babe in the Christian in walk. Peace. He was yep. a babe in the Christian walk with Jesus. Mm -hmm. He has to grow, just right. like each one of us has to grow. We don't start where we are at age six, where I'm 68 now. That's right. And who leads us to get to where we are each day by day? And as know, I was a teenager, I look back on some of the silly things I used to think were great and fun and I, that I did back then right. and saying, what in the world was I thinking? And I, as I talk to other people that are my age and adults, just about every one of us has the same story. We look back on our childhood mm -hmm. and say, what was I thinking? You know, I the know things I, I used to think were really cool, I look at and, nah. Mm -hmm. That's and right. Isn't that what it says in Corinthians? Mm -hmm. I look in the mirror and I, I don't like what I see. That's right. As a child, I walked as a child, I spake as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away the childish things. That's right. And that's part of that walk with Christ as you grow. Right. And just because a person is a new Christian that just got converted, they're still going to have issues and things that they're dealing with, and we need to love them as they grow and carry and grow and walk through these processes. That's right. Rather than... What in the world are you thinking, or why did you do that? Yeah, right. No, we don't. We just, you know, pick them back up and go in peace. You know, we're just... That's what so Philippians 1.6, it says we don't have to worry about the final outcome, right? We can say, you know, we can teach them the right ways, but we don't condone them. We don't, you know, that's wrong, you know, but we lift them up continually, you right. know? And it says we can trust in God, and he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. So, Ellen G. White, I want to um, emphasize in the, uh, the Review and Herald, it says, God's work, not ours. And she says, now here is the very thing that we want to understand, that it is not our work, but God's work, and we are only instruments in his hands to accomplish it. We want to seek the Lord with all of our hearts, and the Lord will work for, for us, Right? So I, I just love that because we're just instru instruments. And I ask God, you know, I, I, I pray that he will empty me of my vessel and who I am and how I see things. Empty all that out and fill me up with your Holy Spirit, Lord, that I may do your great work, that I may do your mission. Apply or, uh, you know, um, help me to become more like you every day. Right, and so that's the instrument piece I think that we, we can get that. out there and actually do this As work we pray. For our own growth That's right. in Christ, we also need to pray that the Lord will put someone in our path that we can say something encouraging to, to help them grow. Amen. Because that's what you just said, basically. We're seed sowers. And even now, I still need seeds sown in my path to mm -hmm. help me continue to grow. Yeah. And, and I don't think anybody has fully arrived. No. Because Jesus said it. He, over and over again to his disciples, follow me. Mm -hmm. He never said, walk beside me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm recalling, you, you know, you just chuckle. Peter got carried away to himself. I, I love Peter. You'll hear me say this regularly. Peter's my hero as far as the disciples because he's mm -hmm. a lot tempestuous, yeah. impulsive, mm -hmm. carried away with himself, That's overloads him. his mouth like me and Harold. <laughs> hey, yeah, I hear you, Harold. And uh, Peter... Jesus was saying or doing something. Peter was saying or doing something, and Pete, Jesus immediately looked at him and said, 
Peter, get behind me, Satan. You don't know what you're talking about. That's all right. But he did it in such a way that it didn't hurt, break Peter's heart or break his spirit. Exactly. But he helped him to grow. And, and even up mm-hmm. until the time of Christ's crucifixion, there's Peter denying Jesus three times. Mm-hmm. And the, just within hours before that, he said, Lord, there's nothing I, you could ever make me do that I would ever deny you. Exactly. And yet Peter denied him three times, just like Jesus said. But Jesus loved him anyway because as soon as he denied him that third time and he, the cock crowed and he looked over there and he saw Jesus looking at him, that look of pity on Jesus' face that he gave him, even though he was suffering mm-hmm. from having been scourged, Jesus still reached out to Peter with his looks and said, it's okay, Peter. Mm-hmm. I knew this was going to happen. Get back on the train. You're okay. You're all right. And see, that's my hope too. Because yeah. I make a bunch of mistakes along the way, just like well, the rest yeah, of us do. Exactly. And I think that, our, well, and I, I've come to learn and, and actually read something that helps me relate to some of my trials and tribulations that I go through. I feel like sometimes there's so many of them. <laughs> um, but you know what? God is actually um, shaping us, forming us, molding us, making us, stretching us, you know. And, and, and the trials are that we can actually be fit for his kingdom. Right. So, you know, if we, we need to be happy in the trials that we have because we know that God is working on us. Absolutely. And so I think that, you know, this uh, Elijah knew that. You know, you, you believe, you, you see, and, uh, and you believe, and um, God, will, God will show you the rest. Right. That's right. We're going to get through, and it's going to work out. Yep. All right. Hey, move let's on. move on, I guess, to uh, Tuesday's lesson. I don't know how far we're going to get in this thing because I, I rarely get finished with the lesson. I, I hope that doesn't bother anybody. <laughs> That's I, all right. And I tell everybody we really need to go home and study more and study more. So, yeah, Harold, I see you telling me I talk too much. But anyway, <laughs> I'll swap chairs with you someday. Come on up. <laughs> now he's telling me I'm okay. Witnessing to a learned Nicodemus. Now, you know, here's another story. Nicodemus, I don't know how wealthy he was. It doesn't matter. But he was one of the educated Jews. He was basically a ruler of the Jews, a learned man, which means he'd been to Harvard University. (laughs) And he'd gotten his terminal degree there in all kinds of knowledge so that he was considered one of the more intelligent people around. Yale, Harvard, Vanderbilt, wherever he went. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But here it is. He's been hearing what Jesus says to the people And it doesn't quite jive with what he learned at university. And he said, but it it intrigues me. I want to know about this a little bit more. What what am I missing? What's going on here? So Nicodemus, with pride in his heart, he comes to Jesus in the night. He doesn't want his buddies to see that he's coming to this man because he doesn't want anybody to get any false ideas about him suddenly bowing down to this, this fellow that's baptizing people wherever he goes and, 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 and throwing out demons and, and healing people with his touch. But something's going on. Something's about this fellow that, I, that intrigues me, and I want to know a little bit about him. Mm-hmm. So he comes to Jesus in the middle of the night, and what does Jesus say to him? Hey, you mean to go back in the womb and be reborn. Be born again. Be and Nicodemus says, now wait a minute. I'm a little bit too big to go back in my mama's womb. That's right. I do know about the birthing process, and that's not possible. What was Jesus really talking about? A conversion. Um, you know, I, I believe God, God has designed all of us, um, our living souls, um, with the ability to know God personally on a personal level, right, to connect to him spiritually. And without that connection with our Heavenly Father, um, there's, there's this, you know, a, a void in our heart, right? There's just that uh, ever so looking for, searching for someone or something to fill it. And maybe Nicodemus had that void, you yeah. know, that needed to be filled. And, uh, and Jesus knows that. Jesus knows everyone and where they are spiritually. Right. And he knows just how to touch to the core he of does. someone's... And he does, and he bypassed. See, Nicodemus came with a little pride in his heart, but he used, and we'll use the term, he, he was being a sycophant to Jesus. You know what a sycophant is? That's a self-seeking flatterer. So here we go in verse 3. I'm going to read this to you. Okay. He comes up to Jesus and says, Rabbi... We know that you are a teacher come from God. Mm-hmm. You're blowing smoke at him. <laughs> right. Trying to get him on his side to think, okay, I'm going to pat you on the back, so now yeah. you'll give me an inch. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you an inch. Now you've got to give me an inch. Mm-hmm. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Right. 
Now, is he being sincere or is he blowing smoke here? At this point, I think he's still blowing smoke, being the sycophant that he was. All right, and then Jesus answered him. This is in verse 3 on John 3, and he says, Most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And isn't that what Nicodemus was really wanting? He thought he had the keys Mm -hmm. to the kingdom of God because he was a teacher. He knew the Bible. He knew the ins and outs of the Bible. Mm -hmm. He could quote the Bible. That's right. But did he understand the Bible? Well, he thought he did, you know. Yeah, he thought he um, did. But did he understand the relationship part of 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 with our God, you know, the spiritual aspect of it? You know, it, and if you, you know, read the Torah, something. which is mm-hmm. the first five books of the Bible, what Jesus is teaching here was taught and presented in the Torah. Mm-hmm. It's there. Yeah. It started in Genesis. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, God came down in form of Jesus mm-hmm. and made a reconciliation process and started it there by the sacrificial lamb and the shedding of blood. You can't save yourself, Adam and Eve. You've got to have the blood to set you free and to, put, and to cleanse you of your unrighteousness. That's right. And this can start that process of, of your growth where that you get reconciled back to God. But it's nothing you did. No. It's by what I did. Jesus came down and they shed the blood of the lamb And he sprinkled the blood, and they started that process of understanding what the sacrificial system was all about. And that it was looking forward Mm -hmm. to the true sacrifice that was coming on the cross. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Nicodemus then said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time? Verse 6, Jesus answered, most assuredly I say unto you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit... He cannot enter the kingdom of God. So he's calling him out the second time on the kingdom of God here. Mm -hmm. You're not going to enter the kingdom of God unless you have a changed heart. It's not by arrogance. It's not by your knowledge. It's by the love and the sacrifice of me on the cross and my blood. That's right. We (laughs) fall in love with, with what Jesus has done, and that is a conversion experience once you... You know, experience the the love for, from our God. You know, and that. So, do you want to continue? Yeah, I'm going to read gonna, on the. Yeah, I'm going to read ahead. on. And then he says, "Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you cannot hear the sound of it, but cannot tell from whence it comes and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit." Nicodemus answered and said to him, "How can these things be? Because here it is." Now he's off of his high horse. He's come down to humble. How can these things be? What are you talking about? Help me understand. I need to see what you're talking about here. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. I'm the learned man, Mm -hmm. and you're teaching me something now. You know, that's that's the big thing. You know, if you ever dealt dealt with academians, a lot of them really have an attitude of thinking, Mm -hmm. I know everything. You've got to just sit down and listen to what I've got to say. You can't teach me anything. Mm -hmm. You ever dealt with those people like that, Mike? Mm -hmm. You went to college. Ever deal with any teachers that were that way? I know I certainly did. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? This is what he's calling him out. He's telling him his profession. And do you not know these things? You're supposed to know this. Haven't you read the Torah? Haven't you understood what the Torah is about? See, we get caught so up into wanting to think of ourselves as something special that you read the text that help build your ego rather than reading the text and emphasizing on the points of where my job is to be humble and be a spirit and a vessel that works with and for other people to bring them to the kingdom of God with me. And I can only go to the kingdom of God if I'm humble. That's right. If I'm humble. Most surely I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. So here it is, Nicodemus, you're you're not there yet. That's right. You're not there. If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Wow. No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. So he really told Nicodemus how it was. But now Nicodemus, did he convert that moment? No, he did not. He left. But the seed was planted. The seed was planted. And Jesus let him alone to let him grow. Similar. The Holy Spirit then has his job to do. Exactly. 
Yeah, so let, let's look at if we consider um, in our own ad education in Adventism, right? I'm a first-generation ad right. Adventist, um, I, but I know I go to church here with a lot of fourth generations, third generations that are learned in, in Adventism. So you think of that as far as, you know, uh, Nicodemus and how he was learned in the doctrines, right? So let's just think about or ask ourselves, you know, if Jesus had said, hey, I know you've got a pretty good grasp on this Adventism doctrines, you know, um, or maybe you just need to know. Maybe maybe we can touch up or just, you know, learn a little bit more about the 1844, right? Yeah. <laughs> or would he ask, um, or, or would he ask us to do a reset, right, and say, uh, go back into the womb and be reborn? I mean, it's, it's, you have to think about, in our situations, we think doctrines are so important, but what about that conversion experience? About be, being reborn is the most important thing that, that God is looking for. Because without that conversion, without that leading of the Holy Spirit, how are, how are we working our partners in, in this whole great commission that he has given us? How can we be led by the Holy Spirit if we have not gone into the womb to be reborn? Right? We're so worried about, well, what more can we know? What more can we learn? What more of this or what can we, you know? But um, anyway, I just think that's important for us to, to understand that God is wanting all of us to be reborn, a conversion experience, start being led, you know, by the one, the creator of all things, right? So we can finish this thing and go home. Knowing Jesus rather than knowing Jesus is the key. Do you truly, truly know Jesus one-on-one? -on -one? It doesn't matter how much of the Bible you know. Nicodemus knew it very well. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're saying here. Seventh-day yeah. Adventists are taught the Bible very well, and there's a ton of us that really know it front to back, all of our theology. But do you know Jesus? Yeah. Do you know Jesus? Is he your personal Savior? Have you had the conversion experience where you recognize that there's nothing that you can do on your own, and no matter how much you study the Bible, that's not going to get you to heaven, only by submitting yourself to Jesus Christ yeah. and growing and yeah. having that conversion experience, which is what Nicodemus eventually had. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm happy for that. So we're going to move on. Yeah, let's move on to the next day. Um, Matthew 19. Let's read Matthew 19, verses 16. Is she rushing me over here? Through 22. <laughs> I've got, well, yeah, I just, we've got some I important Thank stuff you, to I mention see that about smile. how this church <laughs> can actually be, you know, how we can, how, how can we change? What can we do in this church to minister to those that are rich and powerful? So, right. yeah, we've kind of, so let's, we let's two, look at this. Two rich people here now. That's right, 19, and then uh, you want to read the 16 through 22? Sure, I can okay. do that. Now, behold, one man came and said to him, good teacher. You know, here it is. He's that sycophant again. Yep. Good teacher, blowing a little smoke. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Mm -hmm. So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that's God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said, all these things I've kept from my youth, what do I still lack? That's right. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Mm. So I think it's important that he, he did the six, the six commandments, which were, you know, how to treat or uh, yeah, the one how the to serve our neighbors. But he left out the first four, which is how to serve God. Right. And so maybe this is another little punch that Jesus had on him, that this is what you're missing. He's, the, the man replies, well, I do all those commandments. He loved his money more than he loved Jesus. Yep. Bottom line. There should have no other gods before me. So and, he, he had, you know, and that was his maybe God. something that... Um, his he wealth, his more. stuff, his status, yep. his prestige, whatever money can buy. He, you know, he had it. All of these people, you know, he got the choice seat in the synagogue when he went in because he was rich and he put chunks of gold into the coffers there for him. And 
you know, the little widow slipped in with her little mite and quietly dropped her little coin into the thing. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said to her, she gave way more than that rich guy did over there. Yeah. Because she gave all she had. Mm -hmm. He gave well, of his excess. Yeah. And let's flip the story. I've got Luke already uh, pulled up here. Let's, let's look at another rich uh, ruler that Jesus spoke with, right? Um, in, in Luke 19, verses 1 through 10, and I'll read this real quick. The, sure. Then Jesus entered and passed through the Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacharias. Did I say that right? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, thank you. Who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short, of, of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. That's what Jesus said to him. I must stay. Come down. I'm going to go home with you and, and hang out with you. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they, say, when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I gave half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore forth, fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he, who, who, he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. So we see this gentleman is more giving. He's, he's willing to give up his possessions. He's already get, given some, but he says, if I need to give more, I'll give up to four times all that I have, you know, all my possessions. Um, so we see two contrasting stories here, right? Um, Bottom line, though, mm -hmm. only Jesus can see your heart. That's right. And know, your, know really where you stand between himself and you. Right. You know, I can see your actions. I can hear your words, but I don't know your heart. That's right. And so, let, what's and so the here story he is, that, Zacchaeus, yeah. he'd had a change of heart. It's obvious here he'd had the change of heart. Yep. The rich young ruler. He fell in love with Je I mean, like he, he he fell in love with the word, with the with the story. Like, he'd already this heard is, enough about Jesus. Mm -hmm. He saw the change that was taking place around him and other people, mm -hmm. and he realized that there was something special about this. Yep. And I want to be on this on this bandwagon with this Jesus. And he was willing to let go of his whatever possessions. I've got on this whatever earth I'm means nothing do. to me. Yeah, I Jesus surrender. Jesus means everything. That's right. The rich young ruler, he was in love with his money. Right. That was more important to him than Jesus. And that's where, that's where it talks about it's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven than for a poor man. I'm trying because to remember the, the verse, uh, the eye of the needle, the camel. Yeah, it's, it's, what in, is, it's on Friday's lesson. Oh, uh, is that on we'll Friday? Get to, yeah, we'll get to it in a minute. Well, I, I wanted to think about, you know, it's harder for a rich man to get, what is it through the, help me out. It, through the eye of the needle. I know Jeremy Centrocchio, thank you. <laughs> it's easy, yeah, it's, that's Matthew, that's Mark 10, 25. Okay. Yeah, so this eye of the needle, so, <laughs> sorry, um, we think of that as like a gate in Jerusalem. I kind of saw this theory, um, and, I, and I liked it. I was like, wow. So there was a gate in Jerusalem, right, which opened after the main gate. So after the main gate was closed down at night, they had this, this little small gate, right, and it was called the eye of the needle. Um, so a camel couldn't pass through it unless he dropped all of his luggage. All, it was for security purposes, Right, so they had to let go of everything that, that was, he was carrying. And so we kind of think of that. Um, I love that, you know, that if a rich men would just, you know, let go of a few things and, and, and surrender to me is what Jesus is saying here, is that I will lead you. It's not necessarily that you have to give it all away. What if we, in, in contrast, what if, the, what if the rich man that said left sorrowful, um, that he had to give up all his possessions. What if he had said, Jesus, I can't do that. I need your help to do that. What if the story had changed a little bit? Right? If it had, you, it would have been a different outcome. There would have been a different there outcome. Was, there was no remorse on this man's part of acknowledging that he needed a Savior. That's right. And now he was willing to buy salvation. He had his money. He was ready to pay Jesus to give him the right words. To, yeah. make, to pat him on the back and say, hey, you're okay, everything's fine. Right. But that's not the way Jesus works. That's right. There, there's three things that money can't buy. You know, I've, I don't know if I've shared this story. It's been a while. 
There's three things that money cannot buy. One is the love of a good woman or the love of a good man, a baby smile, and your ticket to heaven. You cannot buy those three things. <laughs> they're right. earned and they're accepted. That's right. That ticket to heaven is free. You're only going to get it by submitting yourself to Jesus Christ and acknowledging that you're in need of a Savior mm. and that you're a sinner. That's right. Yeah, as for uh, Zacchaeus, I don't feel that he promised to give up half of his possessions to the poor to, to be saved. No, he didn't. He'd done that just because he wanted to. He wanted He'd to. He'd fallen in love with Jesus. He had an encounter with Jesus. Yeah. An encounter that, you know, poured over into his life, and that's that love motivation. Once that encounter with Jesus and that love pours over into our lives, it starts to just fill up so much that it starts overflowing, and we want to share that with others. It's, it's love motivated. So right. I think that's what... It's important that we do. So let's move on yep. to Thursday's okay. lesson because we are running out of time. Jesus knew how to make friends with the powerful. and He was admired and respected by many of these people at the same time and despised also by many. Also, many of the rich and powerful did not openly come to Jesus right away. They waited until they were certain that Jesus was truly the Son of God. Such was the case with both Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Mm -hmm. Now, we hadn't heard anything about no. Joseph of Arimathea until after the death of Christ on the cross. But he obviously had begun, begun his process of walking with Jesus mm -hmm. before that point. Read Matthew 27, 57 through 60 and see what that tells us. Matthew... What does this account tell us about how the Lord used a rich man who clearly had been impacted by Jesus? Matthew 27, 57 through 60. 57 through 60. Okay, that says, Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself has, had also became a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in, the, in his new tomb, which he had honed out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone over against the door of the tomb and departed. So dear sweet Joseph, mm -hmm. you know, I can only imagine anybody that really was a Jew at that time having seen the crowd and seen how the, the leaders of the Jewish people had falsely accused Christ, had got him convicted of treason, basically, right. and then convicted to die on the cross. And, of course, they had carried out their evil intentions through the, with the use of the Romans to get Christ crucified. Yep. Anybody that stood up and said anything against this mob mentality would have been immediately considered an enemy of the state. That's right. It would not have been good. And on this, <laughs> as we've been studying the book of John, one of the things that was pointed out that you didn't want to have happen to you is you didn't want the rabbi or the leading authorities to say, you're banished from coming into the temple. You can't come anymore. Mm -hmm. we, we banish you because of what your, your arrogance, your rudeness, or your wrongness in, in, in not following our law the way we see the law to be felt, followed. So these people were highly going against the grain. In fact, the, the disciples were in the upper room terrified for their life. They'd hid out mm -hmm. to get away from, for fear of, for their life. And yet here comes Joseph of Mary of Mathia. Jesus died. He says, I want to take care of his body. Straight to Pilate. I Straight to Pilate. If that's not a conversion experience, I'm not afraid for my life at all. Do what with me as you will, but I want to take care of the body of Jesus. That's right. Let me have this little token where I can show my love and respect for my Savior. And everyone just has a, a part to play in the story of redemption for each of our souls. And it's for everyone. This redemption is not just for you or me. It's for everyone. And um, Are you, you know, willing to stand up? That's right. Are you willing to stand up in the face of adversity in the crowd? Because we're told that in the last days, those that are following Jesus are going to be persecuted. You're not going to be welcome. You're going to be considered the pariah, and you're going to be hunted down. Yep, just Are you ready to stand up no matter what for Jesus of, Christ? Think of Daniel, you know, like a consistent Daniel. With, with our faith. You know, it's going to get hard, and it's going to get 
trying. And then, of course, here we see Nicodemus again. He brought the spices and stuff, so he wasn't afraid yeah. of, for his life either. Yep. He stood firm, stood up. Yeah. And you know what? We're out of time. Yes, we are. So we've got to Good close. Study. So right. do you want to have a word of prayer as we close out this? And I do encourage well, you. That do we didn't get to Friday's lesson, but there's good meat there on Friday too. Take your time and study because the big thing is no matter what, Jesus loves us. God loves us. He wants each and every one of us in his kingdom with him. Amen. So, All right, so we do have a free offer this week. It is, um, is it a sin to be tempted? Um, so you can click on that QR code or visit us online at whitehousesda.com forward slash library and fill out the form there, and we will get that shipped out to you quickly. Um, also, we do have, we offer uh, Bible studies on godled.org. So go to that website and get your free Bible study if you would like to learn more about what God has for your life. Um, please visit that. It's a great Bible study. So godled.org. All, All right. right. Thank you very much for you your help here? on the lesson. You want to pray? Go ahead. Okay. Dear Father, thank you so much for this great mission. Lord, we, we, uh, we know that the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we we know that you have come to save us all. So, Lord, help us to understand the rich and the powerful. And, Lord, we know that we might stereotype them in some ways, thinking that they know everything, but maybe some of them are just lonely and looking for a friend that can just, you know, um, offer a Bible study and want to get to know them personally. So, Lord, help us as a church to conform into your will for us to reach those powerful and those rich people that are out there that are in need of or wanting to know more about you. So, Lord, just change and transform us as we go forward on this great mission for your, for your work, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.